Welcome. This is the December 20th Jail and Zones call. We have Dan, Jamie, Jan, myself, Michael, and others may join. Let's dive right in. Dan has some questions about avoiding repetition in a jail configuration. He has a blog post about that, and I will bring that up. I will try to bring that up. Boom. No. My mouse is not liking life right now. Boom. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Mouse does not. Okay. So ba basically, I have a bunch of file sets that I want to perform repeated tasks upon. Sometimes it's jailing them. Sometimes it's unjailing them. Sometimes it's G-mounting them. And I want to do this all within the configuration. And I know I can do this with something like Ansible, but can I do it solely within the jail configuration? And immediately yes. Jan and Jamie came to mind. Jamie, uh, did you, you have do... an idea? You were here first. Sorry, Jamie first. Oh, no, that's OK. I mean, if you've got an answer ready, let's go with it. Yes, I have. Uh, so first of all, it looks like they're all descendants of one data set. So what you can no, do that's is- not going to work. Uh, uh, oh, sorry sure, sure to interrupt you, but I'm familiar with your solution of where you you do everything underneath solution? all the children, all the children. And sorry. yes and no, uh, what I re would recommend is instead of listing them all, because that too is a form of repetition, just lots of data you repeat instead of the little bit of code in front of it. Uh, what you can do is you can do a ZFS list dash R for recursive. Uh, dash uppercase H to get a, a tabular output. And then you filter only the name column and you filter by type so that you don't get the snapshots. And then you can get a sorted by however you like uh, um, lines of data set names and that you can pipe into X arcs because the ZFS set command uh, can take multiple uh, data volume or sorry file system volume or snapshots. So you would basically now, have one command to produce the list of data sets as to standard output and pipe it into X uh, ZFS set the property in this case jailed. Um, yeah. On and then take the other ones. So that you only invoke the ZFS set command once, unless your list is so long that it doesn't fit into one command invocation, then it gets broken up into multiples. Okay. Um, you can still um, just even feed a here dog how into do you do that. that. The... I'm and just wondering how do you do that within a jail configuration, though? Because um, because the uh, hooks Should are I be executed treating the jail the... configuration just the shell script. Yes, it's this is just passed basically to system through the shell. Okay. Uh, what you have to watch out for is that uh, you have to double quote because uh, yeah. basically the string value after the expansion by jail.conf gets then passed to the shell, which is a reason Do to really that? try to avoid having syntactically interesting values in there. So because first the jail properties and uh, verbals are replaced and then the result is given to the shell. Uh, which is neat because uh, as, if I remember correctly, ZFS data sets don't have anything which causes quoting problems within the uh, character set they are allowed to use. So you can just basically write a list of data sets uh, expand them recursively uh, so that you don't have to repeat as much and feed it into X arcs with a pipe. Okay. Um, I'll have a look at that. Do you, do you have a URL somewhere that has an example of this? And we'll no, add it because to this uh, there isn't a URL because the problem is that the only interesting part is the combination and that doesn't have a main page. So you would have something like, uh, let me just, yeah, just play with it. Drop in some dummy code. Yes. Uh, cool. So you would do something like. I, I am interested in, I am interested in your solution, but 
the more I think about it now, the more I think I'm going to do this in Ansible because that's uh, really where it should be done anyway. Because that's yes, where I uh, in that case, job. what is really neat, what you can do is uh, use Ansible in pull mode to just take the configuration from a Git repository or even a local one. So instead of running so that it even updates automatically, but you can also point it to some uh, central Git server and it will run the current state of some branch. Uh, uh, so, um, well, so this is what I would uh, use uh, in this case. So, um, thank you for that. The other day, I, I heard some people refer to this as the stream on um, on social media. Someone said you you mentioned this in your stream the other day. I never once considered this to be a podcast or anything like that. So. Oh. Yeah, that's um, so. Uh, the data set in this case is the assumption that, or whatever yeah. you call the variable. I normally keep the root data set of the jail in the yeah. property data set. Um, so, and it I, may I, even I'm be that you with get... what And the other thing is, you can use multiple starting points and then you recursively yeah. walk them all. Yeah. And because ZFS set is idempotent, it shouldn't be a problem if you have a, a re repetitions because the subtrees overlap or something. Yeah. Uh, if that and is a problem, you I just do... pipe it through sort uh, and unique or sort as you. What I would do. Okay. What, what I would probably do here is use the ZFS list command to get a list of the data sets and store that in a variable and then pipe it to the various things I need to do. Yeah, the problem is that you uh, can't have, as far as I know, uh, this expansion happen once. So basically the problem is that you, while you can have this kind of ZFS list in a property and then execute the shell code from a property, you can't really store the result of a shell execution in a gel.conf property so you don't have it in the uh, you only have command execution at the, as the last step as the of the expansion and processing yeah. you can't do an earlier yeah. command I, expansion I, I, the only thing you can do is write it to a file for example in a, a prepare or pre-start and then use it later on in a created uh book but then you need a yeah. temporary uh file somewhere and probably a the logical place where it would be somewhere under var run jails or something uh, to store this list in a file. And then you can just pipe this file into XArx multiple times or redirect it as input. You don't have to abuse a pure little cat for that. I have a feeling what I'll do is Ansible. Yeah, Ansible, and really the downside what I of... should be doing because that's what I started doing and I sort of drifted away from it. I should get back to it. The problem with using Ansible for this is the startup cost. Uh, you will basically lose orders of magnitudes of startup latency. The shell script this... will probably run in milliseconds and the Ansible job will run several seconds just of st because of startup cost. I... Um, if you do that a lot, oh, on, um, it starts to matter. What you can do to uh, reduce the cost of Ansible is write your own uh, modules so that yeah. you need fewer commands. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let, let's yeah. see if this is in but context for Dan. Go ahead, Dan. All, all I do with Ansible is create the configuration file. I have static jails. I don't have on-demand jails. This is just to create the configuration file once. Okay, in that case, if it's your uh, jail.conf, especially now that we have includes, the obvious thing to do with Ansible would be to just template out the file you include. Yeah. Of course, that is a one-time cost and is basically free from a one-time perspective. It, it, hardly, it hardly ever happens so I spin up a new jail. And, and then you have but the if rest for of some reason the configuration were to change, 
I would just go back to Ansible and update it and run yeah. it, run it again. But this exactly the, the difference between the starting and stopping a jail and provisioning it. Okay, okay, one at a time. Yes, Dan, does that <laughs> set you in the right direction? Yes, or at least give you some food for thought. Uh, Jamie, um, are there any strategies you, we missed in that? Some hidden tool that we've been overlooking forever. But this is a perfect example for why I wanted uh, this quite crazy feature to have the jail includes or the jail command basically execute configuration snippets it includes when they are executable and read the output because then you could have a file you put in an include and it get execute it gets executed as a child process of a jail command and it outputs the uh, jail conf to define this so the downside is of course that it's so dynamic that you can uh, easily shoot yourself in the foot but uh, it's such a flexible and powerful mechanism that you can do basically anything with it. You could have a jail.conf stored in an SQLite database or something, or which would okay. be really nice okay. for jail managers and programmatic access. Yep. Jamie, are you still with us? And do you have any I, thoughts I on this? Am. I, I okay. made a couple of comments, not realizing I was muted. <laughs> okay, no worries. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the main one being, yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot, but you know, we like that sort of thing here. We're Unix yeah. people. It's yeah. a feature. Yeah. yeah. And if your configuration files writable only by root are executable by accident, that's on you. Yeah. If what file is? If your normal configuration file, which you didn't want to use as a script, uh, is marked as executable with the X permission, uh, that's on you. Oh, yeah. If you messed up your uh, you must get badly or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Antonig has some very interesting questions. And I say we just take them one by one. I have a question about the last one, but let's just dive in. So, Maid, did you bury the lead? Do you have a class going on? What's what? Tell us more. Are you muted, Antrenig? Yes. Am I back now? Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I just want to type in my last question in there because okay, I had some questions from the students. I'll just I type in this it. one too. And I hate Google. Go to hell, Google. Jesus. Okay. One, two, three. Paste. Uh huh. Uh, renames only a pair X A and not pair um X B. Okay, so a uh, long story short, um, couple of weeks ago, I started a new uh student group, which there is also a website for. By the way, I might be able to paste the website in here. It's actually a boot camp. I think that's what people call it these days, right? A boot camp for people who are learning computers from ground up. Here's the website for it. We do it once a year. It goes for pretty long, about 140 hours. Uh, basically, people who uh, who have uh, small or no computer experience to end up being, you know, viable for the market. Uh, most of them are going to go into the direction of programming or um, uh, security, as in security operations. Uh, think stuff like blue teaming. However, they don't. Uh, one of the biggest issues from universities and even programming instructors is that kids don't learn Unix, which is like the thing that you use the most when you're doing programming. So I thought, okay, it's a good idea to teach them operating systems, Unix, as well as uh, computer networking. And we do it with uh, Linux, with LXC, and FreeBSD with the GLs. I'm kind of proud that only after 30, 35 hours, they're actually able to create a jail from scratch by just reading my and uh, the Dan's blog posts. So that's been going very well. Um, so, but I got a lot of good questions in the process. Um, 
Uh, some of them I do know the answers of. Some of them I don't know if I know the right answer. So the first one was, uh, and I'll bring the context into this. Someone asked me, hey, in Docker, you can run as a user, not necessarily a root. And there is a good amount of separation as the, as in, you know, user Dexter cannot destroy the Docker container of user Dan, right? It's it's like Docker, the demon knows how to do all about that, as well as in from a, a kernel point of view, the namespaces do have their separation. And they asked me, can Jailer do that? Because they also had a look into my tool, Jailer. And I thought, how would I even implement this on Jailer? I mean, there is a dirty way of like of, of like having some kind of metadata inside the jail config, but it's still running as root. And I thought, hey, the ideal scenario is is would be if if we can run a jail as a user, that would be the ideal scenario. Now you can actually have a separation. So the first question is, uh, how far are we from having, um, you know, from having a uh, non-root jails like is there a lot of hacking going on can a group of students because i mean the jail uh, the jail syscall itself in the kernel is not that big uh, uh that that would be a very good 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 thing to know if anyone knows the answer i'll be very happy and i might have actually be able to like guide the students into hacking around the code and figure out if we can have non-root jails yeah it's not a um technical problem at all to do. It is merely a problem of research, of okay. making sure that uh, we are not causing security problems when we do mm -hmm. such. And unfortunately, the problem of research covers the whole kernel. <laughs> or at least a lot of sitting around and talking with people who are familiar with security points. Yeah. The only way I see this happening if it is locked away behind a, a privileged CCTL until uh, there has been a lot of real world experience. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first step. The next problem is that you kind of have to do a lot of privileged things around jails rather than just creating the jail, which yes, that would be a probably less than 20 line change if you don't care about the security implications. Okay. But the other things you have to do is uh, mount a, re a restricted uh, device file system, uh, somehow attach the jail to the network. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see a way how an unprivileged uh, jail could uh -huh. use anything but complete network stack inheritance or maybe alias networking. Uh, because it can, for sure it can't create uh, a new uh, e-pair or other kind of virtualized network interface to attach a new VNet. And then there's a whole problem of whatever. Well, That's a very good point. So, um, and the other problem is that, yeah, even if you normally uh, you use the jail configuration file to add new alias addresses as the jail is started. Uh, you also can't do that unless you have the right privileges. It may be possible to write a mandatory access control module to allow a group or a user to add, similar to what IP ICL does, to mm -hmm. busy, not just deny, but also allow this user is allowed to, for example, take IP addresses from this slash 64 and put them on this interface with, with this prefix length so that basically this user can put host addresses from this prefix on this interface. Got it. Uh, but that again brings up the problem that suddenly you don't need privileges on the host if the host does it for you, but instead you have to have the network be mm -hmm. configured on, for you so that this works. Uh, what is far more feasible, I think, in the short term is to have a privileged helper which exposes the socket-based API to basically instantiate a jail from this template. And then this privileged helper does it for you. And be, if you do it over a Unix socket, you can uh, have the kernel tell the privileged server which effective user ID and group ID you have so that 
it can make sure that the startup code inside for jail is run with the right user ID again. So this brings us don't risk a confused deputy situation. This brings us to Jamie's point, which is research. Because like yeah. when when we started talking, I didn't even think about DevFS or networking stack. DevFS, I was thinking FDS, you know, uh, yeah. mount points, uh, yeah. data for delegation. So it's similar yeah. to what uh, Dan did in the beginning. Uh, I see. Resource I see. Uh, constraints uh, like hierarchical resource limits, uh, hard and soft limits, um, yeah. CPU sets, whatever else you need. Uh, creating the ZFS data sets to even hold the jail file systems. Mm -hmm. So all of this is, yeah, there's a long okay. matter, but you can sidestep the problem Jamie uh, hinted at by saying, yes, you have, busy, have to basically audit every kernel subsystem, at least the non-trivial ones mm -hmm. for potential interactions. If you instead expose only basically trusted templates through an API, you are restricting the attack surface to anything reachable through this template. Okay. So, for example, you if you can only create basically this specific, yeah, it's basically run, similar to running a shell script with sudo, a one on okay. root at this point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that that, that, that's, be, uh, that's what the student ended up doing for now is basically writing pseudo rules and, and do as rules as a yeah, way um, to give users access to the jail command as well as the gexec command. But uh, obviously, then, it's not a nice way to do that. Because now that we're talking, I'm also thinking like, what if user Dan creates the jail, but he also wants user Dexter to be able to gexec into his jail. So like, there's a lot of questions that start yeah, rising once point. once you start thinking about this yes uh, so uh, it is does that sudo yeah. is um, far too powerful for its own good yeah uh, it, depending on how you compile it it can even query ldap for well, yeah yeah sudo has done that integrations and it was a nightmare but it was yeah. fun yes exactly it's yeah normally uh, always the wrong solution even if it is also tempting <laughs> Yeah. Instead, uh, use do what um, Dan intends to do and template yeah. it out yeah. from your source of truth into the configuration format so okay. that it's always available at runtime and you never yeah. fail to perform an operation because your LDAP service is unreachable. Yeah. So Nick made so, a point about exec jail user. Is that where root chooses how something's executed within a jail or so jxec takes two different kinds of uh, user flex uppercase and lowercase one selects uh, basically does the privilege dropping with the host user database and the other one with the jail user database uh, and these can uh, they shouldn't be in a properly managed deployment but they can be um, contradictory, or at least it can be that the host doesn't have an entry for the jailed user, which, for example, let's say you have a piece of software which is installed via a package. The package creates a service user and group, and the package was never installed on the host. So the host doesn't know that this user ID, for example, is the uh, Postgres or MySQL default user ID. And then you get a process with just the numerical user and group from the host's point of view. That's actually a very good feature. Yeah, I absolutely forgot about that. So like you can j exec as dub 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 into the as dub 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 in the jail. Right? right? Yeah. So you don't you don't have to like go in as root and then go to uh the, the jail. Okay. And then and go can, to the, the make, dub dub dub. You can make jails that never have a root running inside them. Um uh -huh. If you do all the, you can, coming back to the original point, can I have rootless jails? The answer is is yain, and you have to do the file system setup as root. You have to do the network setup as root. But once that's done, um, there's nothing stopping you from having a thing which is make me um, a jail in this container, and I have to accept all the other stuff. So what yeah. you can do right because 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 by default when I'm running by default when I'm running a jail, 
there is a user cron running cron and the user syslog running syslog and like I, I I don't ever see a root inside the JL usually in an out of the box situation, you know. So um, yes, you do see root inside every J. Oh, and you have to, uh, but only during it is CRC. because yeah, the, it is CRC. the RC script mm -hmm. that's in FreeBSD fall flat on their face if you set this. Uh, jail uh, property I just mentioned, you can set uh, the jail to s user equals zero, which means that there is no privileged user. Uh, so basically user ID zero and uh, group ID zero no longer are privileged. They're just another user ID with just the permission. So basically root inside the jail cannot do anything a normal user ID couldn't do. The problem is that now basically you can't use SU and similar commands to drop privileges mm -hmm. anymore. So you can't start as root and then run uh, cron as a dedicated user or gotcha. okay, cron runs as root, but okay. uh, you can't run Nginx as an other user ID then because you need a privilege to chain, to drop from root because now there is no dropping root privilege because there is the root privilege to drop from the kernel's mm -hmm. point of view. It now looks like, yeah, this random user wants to become another random user. Nope. So you can use it, but you have to basically replace uh, all the RC scripts with your own little uh, jail.conf uh, exec hooks, which works, uh, but yeah. You can also uh, set the user to look up before the execution happens so that you can still run hooks as a specific user. But yeah, that's about... The nice thing about doing this is that the jail really never contains any privilege which still exists within a jail normally. So mm -hmm. it can't be used to, for example, remove, remove the uh, file system immutable flags for system files. Uh, on, uh, with secure level equals uh, zero or one or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, that's something else you can do. You can raise the secure level of the jail. It's mm -hmm. a bit, yeah, 1980s Unix in a bit little bit, bit more secure and more annoying. But for such a basically managed jail, it's a good fit. Okay. Um, so the second question I got, which was, it, it was the typical problem. One of the students wanted to install FreeBSD and he looks in the download page and is like, oh, stable. I definitely want to use a stable operating system. That's yeah. what I want to download. I'm like, no, no, no. We're talking about the ABI, young boy. That's the ABI. <laughs> yeah. You want to release. So yeah. um, I can easily you know, explain You want to them. release engineering. <laughs> you want so, the rel branch because the release branch is the frozen artifact of the release date yes so if but yeah so, so we talked so we talked about like okay what's release it, it means that the release engineering team has released that and what's current which is the current place that the developers are working on but now i have to explain stable now i even couldn't get that part properly because well i mean stable is when we do like mfc merge from current it goes from current back to stable but now I'm having a hard time explaining what's the feature-wise difference between stable and current. So let's take a very good example, the dot include that Jamie made. We did it on 14 current, which got released on 14 release. But did that feature ever go back to like 13 dot what? No. 13 stable. Like how does that part work uh, basically? Um... Depends on the hour of day, no? <laughs> no, it doesn't really. Uh, the problem is that a dot zero release is a special case. So mm -hmm. it would be better to look at how something uh, get, gets into 13.2. That, so, that's a good idea, yep, yep. So uh, for example, for if something to get into 13.2, what has to happen? Someone adds it to current, then mm -hmm. it goes from back then, 14 was current. Mm -hmm. So it goes into 14 current. Mm -hmm. Then it gets moved from current to stable, and then mm -hmm. from stable to the uh, the next release 
inside the minor release is created. So previously so there's a concept of major and minor releases. Yes. And a major release, uh, basically you can't run without the compact packages and so on, the mm -hmm. old code. Um, the idea here is that you basically can just install an FreeBSD 13.1 package and a 13.2, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to work with the one annoying exception of kernel modules, especially GPU drivers. Yeah, Other kernel modules may actually work, but the GPU driver is so tightly integrated with the virtual memory, which is about performance and correctness, so it's always going to change between releases. Um, yeah. So basically okay. what happens is features go from current to stable to st and then to minor a release. new uh, release is taken from the stable branch, but basically just forking a new branch of it. And this branch is the release. And then from that, the release engineering is created. And that is then maintained by the release engineering okay. team with only bug fixes and security fixes. Yeah. Um, th th this actually also had another question that came. So we were talking how you can run old versions of FreeBSD in a jail. So which also means that if you have currently, if you currently have 15 current, you can run inside of it 14 release, 13.2 release, etc. How does uh, the stable branch go into this? I, I The only answer that I came out with, but I've never tried in my life, was looking at the ABI level with uname dash capital K and uname dash capital U to make sure that it's compatible. Because because the currents don't have a minor version number. Right? It's just like 13 current, 14 current. Right? Yeah. So, sorry, 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 13 stable, 14 stable, right? There's no 14.1 stable, etc. right? So is that the only way to make sure that your GLs will be fine if you're running a stable on the host? Um, no, there's a... There is a oh. more precise version number. Um dot uh, OS version or something? It's yeah. kern.os rel and kern.os version. Yeah. Kern OS rel, I think. Uh, OS rel. Rel date? Yeah, rel date. Uh, basically, this is a... Uh, Every time the ABI is intentionally extended in a significant way, this number is bumped so that ports can uh, basically if def on it. For example, the WireGuard port uh, knows which version of FreeBSD has the in kernel WireGuard and which doesn't. So the old one uses the user space ton tap device implementation as a dependency, and the other one by default targets the uh, Sorry, what is current.os. version? Is that a CCTL? Uh, no, this one, uh, and you can override this for jailed so that commands which have to know this, for example, FreeBSD update, oh. the right thing by default. Because normally, let's say you're running a 12.4 on a 13.2 or a 13.2 on a 14, zero. And normally, the FreeBSD update command will use a CCTL or uname which then uses the CTL to find out which version is running, they'll then tell you that, eh, well, uh, nothing to do because I'm already at the version you wanted. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you have to tell it, no, no, okay. I know that the kernel version is this, but I want you to pretend you're this user land version, which I have to then know. Okay, makes and, sense. Yeah, that's a bit annoying. If your jail manager manages that for you and it manages the, for example, FreeBSD update okay. process, then that is hidden away because it's an annoying implementation detail which just mm -hmm. pops up there. Okay. Um, uh, Jamie, next question. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, that sounds makes sense to me. Yes. Uh, next question that I got, which was actually a very good question, because I gave a bunch of students a lot of um, GLs to work on, and uh, I was like, okay, what's the uptime? And the uptime command returns the uptime of the host. The only way that I could figure out how to get the uptime of a GL was either to look at the time that the first process inside of it has been running, if you're lucky, I mean, the process might have been gone because like there's no init running in there or using last because last does get recorded when you're doing ETCRC and um, inside the UTX, UTX, 
Am I remembering the Unix? Yeah, Unix time something, right? Inside the UTX file, you get like system boots up every time that the GL gets started. Uh, are there any other ways or like, can, can we get um, this kind of metadata? The closest thing I can think of is from the host point of view, the A time, uh, the C time or M time of the JET file. The what yeah, file? And that is just from the host point of view, yes. Yeah, but not A time, C or M. I don't know which one. If this file is overwritten or replaced, if it is overwritten, it's the M time. If uh, not, it's uh, the M and C time, mm -hmm. not the A time. The A time is probably not updated on a modern ZFS system. Of what file or it. any file? Uh, the jail ID file. But you might not have that. That's You're not guaranteed to have one of those. No, right. you're not. And it can be uh, clobbered over by just running touch on it. This is a feature that I think I should add. Yeah. I like. I, I think this is a great feature you should add. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jamie, yeah, that'd yeah. be great. To MJG, I don't know who MJG's name is, but talk to MJG. We've been talking about this in the Developers so, IRC channel. So basically, what you have it to do be, is on jail create be the uptime. Yeah. And That's my That's my take. Yeah. Yeah, it would be trivial. It's one of those sys control things that a lot of jail has a lot of it, just another one of those. Yeah, and the problem is which one do you want? Because I can also see a jail wanting to know the host uptime. So, sorry, the, the, the file that we're talking about, we're talking about basically var run jail name dot ID. Yeah. Okay, got it. Now now I'm on par. And you can't get to that from within the jail. Right. And of course. to me, um, to the you virtual may be able to uh, null FS mount it, <laughs> read only. It's now that we can also null FS yeah. files. That's a good idea. But no, I mean, I, I, I've been doing it with, uh, let me see, TM0. I've been doing it with the last command. And, uh, well, the problem with the last command is that it might get rotated for some random reason, God knows, right? So th that's That's been a pain for me. var log utx log dot zero. And okay, now I got the boot time, November 28th. Absolutely correct matches with the uh, j j the jail ID file that uh, in, in var run. So I don't know why the utx file gets rotated when it's like empty practically. Uh, who the hell even does that? I'm, I'm assuming there's like a periodic happening in the background, yeah. probably. Uh, but yeah, th that's the only way that I could figure out, and I don't like it. It's a very, very... Uh, I mean, I would love to have like, you know, jailer list print the uptime of a jail, just like Docker does, you know, like started five seconds ago or whatever, something like that. So that, that's been a pain. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that question did SPL come up. Is a jail manager, so it could use its state directory where it stores its ever state, if there is any, uh, to just yeah, put but, in that uh, file. but that yeah. is true. But the whole point of jailer is to not do any random shit, like, just like every <laughs> other jail manager does. I know, you know like, yeah. I know. So, just... yeah. Hmm. Okay, that was a very good question from the students. Um, let's see so, what else uh, they have. I think one of these two RC.d mm -hmm. scripts will be your culprit. That is, that's just an assumption. Oh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go over the periodics. Yeah, I'll go over the periodics. And the, those are just ran by cron, right? So if I disable cron in the jail, mm. it shouldn't... Yeah, but that has other implications you can disable individual uh, scripts there yes that's a good the downside yeah. is that then oh, the oh, accounting oh, database isn't on. rotated holding on dan what you got um, th this this is a simple solution for an interim solution uh cron has an at reboot command on that command uh, yeah. oh, come on please don't it's not a bad idea to blog about it. I mean, it's not a permanent solution. It is solution. a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> it is a bad Be idea. Be super to clear on what reboot. you're achieving there. You at reboot, you do something, no, you it, set a flag it, or what? Yeah. yeah. Well, cr cron, crontab.conf has 
ampersand reboot as a time um, field. And you can use that. Is that it's a lie. At reboot gets started every time cron D is started. So if you restart cron, your at reboots get restarted. Oh. Uh, it doesn't really know. It's own it's it's a yeah, an old fashioned Unix lie. Uh, <laughs> and it's an add <laughs> Um yeah. So the less bad idea would be to write your own little five line rc.d script. I, um, I'm thinking that there might be an actual rcd script right now that's writing it somewhere, but I think that yeah, might be UTS there are probably itself. Probably multiple ones which, if you have writable file systems, implicitly do this. But again, unless you have a dedicated file for it, it's kind of legitimate to touch the file later and then invalidate this mm. and basically clobber your recorded M time. Have a look for first boot. There's a whole bunch of things that are done yeah. with the first boot mm -hmm. sentinel flag, um, all yeah, one word, the, first boot. And if you're going to do a, another clutch, that's, that's a good clutch. Let him finish, Jan, let him finish. Sorry. Yeah, yeah you, you, you would have to get it to do it every boot, but... Um, that's fair enough. If you have, um, I think it's slash first boot present in the file system and it's immutable, then um, it will always happen every time the jail starts. So where it is? It's just grab first boot and rc.d. I think it's right at the root of the file system. I think it's slash first boot from memory. Yeah, the slash first boot on the top level of the root file system. Uh, this file exists. The system assumes that it is the first boot it will then uh, run a bunch of rc.d scripts tagged with the first boot keyword like uh, growfs uh, and growfsf step and so on. Uh, and the zpool uh, re uh, guid script, at least in 13.02, there may be more on, uh, on uh, 14. Let me check. Is there anything new? Yeah, zpool upgrade. There's a bunch of stuff there. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah, I, I, I could not man here. I assume it would be in here, but I, I can't find it first. But it's, it's not documented in the hierarchy. And, and for what it's worth, I can't seem to get that reboot thing to work within the jail anyway. Um. So the reboot or first boot? Uh, maybe that all of the existing uh, first boot scripts are also marked as a skip inside a jail. No, re reboot. Oh, Just at reboot. reboot, reboot oh, interesting. Uh, maybe Grundy has yeah, some special yeah, logic. I have never no. used at reboot I'm in not a. Sure. I'm not positive that it's not running, but my simple test oh. is not showing. Are we running Vixicron? Well, heavily patched cron. Oh. Uh, we are running Vixicron. Maybe we should ask uh, Uncle Paul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. but previously uh, Vixicron is not really upstream Vixicron. There's a lot, quite relatively large. Maybe we should update diff. it. <laughs> and we have things he doesn't have in the upstream and probably the other way around. Yeah. Okay. And it may be that at reboot isn't processed inside of jails. I don't know. I've only ever used it on hosts without jails. So it's a quick and dirty way a user can do something when the system starts. To, to auto run in a way which is not privileged because a user can edit his or her own crone tab by themselves without any privileged commands because the Quantab command allows them to just edit their Quantab. Well, without any privileged commands, except for, of course that Quantab command itself today is privileged. Yeah, it's set UID, but uh, it's not like you need some pseudo permission or something. True, just file privilege. Move on to the next question. Yeah, so the next two questions are kind of related. Um, and, 
uh, Jan, I know you have ideas, but those are like mostly yes or no or like single sentence questions. I d honestly don't want to go into the details of GL Demon and how yeah. the demon on FreeBSD sucks. That's a no. It's know, not that it sucks. It's intentionally limited. Yeah, it, it, it is a presentation for another day. You know. Okay, it's so just so out of scope. <laughs> So, so the question was, can we, is it possible to monitor a jail? And the only thing that came to my mind is run JLS in a loop with, with a JSON output, if you're smart enough and, you know, see if a jail has died or not. There are better but then, ways. Yeah. But, but uh, the, then there was like the question of persist. Does persist mean if all the, pro if the, all the processes died inside the jail the jail still exists as in like in the kernel there's still a gid how does the jail monitoring and the jail persistence affect each other Th that that was something that we got a good question out of because uh, the, when they tried stuff like this on like, like let's say docker for example the philosophy not the practice though the philosophy of docker is oh you should run a single binary welcome to golang world right Okay, you're running a single binary in a single container, which probably it's even, you know, uh, uh, statically linked. Thank you, go run time, and that, that's it. But then you have jail land, which is you're running an actually complete operating system, sometimes hundreds of megabytes in size, and it's running multiple processes inside of them, PHP, MySQL, blah, blah, blah. Let's say all of the processes died. Does that mean that the jail is still alive? Or so, how do you actually monitor that the jail is alive? So, yeah basically th those okay. is the context um, of the story the, there are multiple facets to your implied question one is the liveness monitoring of services jails are just a special case of that you can also have an unresponsive service on a host so do you really want a liveness check of an application there the jail is just a um, small implementation detail which can make management significantly easier, but it's not really the big thing you want to manage. So if you want to have, let's say, your uh, next cloud service and you want to know, does it respond? Can my dummy test user log in, upload a file, delete the file and be done with it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to have an application level health check. Uh, this is half because of the complexity it norm it really has to be polling and this is where things like external uh reconvergence loops like the kubernetes one come in sure like send the kernel or stuff for, like that um just knowing if the jail is around so yes running jls uh, every second kind of works but it's very inefficient it is at the same time very slow because you can restart thousands of jails a second if they're lightweight enough. So that's not really a good idea. Um, but there is a kernel module available as a package. Uh, I posted the name devctl jail kmod. It has been around for years and it hasn't run into compatibility issues in all the time I've used it. So it's, in my opinion, this code really belongs in base. Hi, Jamie. Uh, so um, this uh, then turns basically jail state changes like creation, destruction, changing properties, attaching from uh, to jails into dev CTL messages, and then you can have dev D respond to them, which is the nice way to do it. And FreeBSD 14 and put you can also use netlink sockets because the dev ctl uh, messages can also be read from the for the first time ever multiple readers not just a single host dev d um using netlink uh, generic uh, system uh, event sockets the downside is that these are just best efforts so this means if you're too slow to consume a, a jail state notification, you just get a notification that you have lost a message or multiple messages. And then you have to run the equivalent of JLS once to get up to date again. Yeah, to, to sync back with it. Okay, yeah, yes. it's a typical problem 
as an Erlanger, we run into these things. Yeah, crash the but container. the nice thing is that because you can have this, uh, what is this, last jail, I think, sort of property, you can use this to loop over all jails with the uh, jail get variable system call. It's a pseudo variable which has a special meaning of basically, yeah, I really, this is the jail ID of the last jail I read. Give me the next one with a larger jail ID. And then you loop over all jails and you get a snapshot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as long as you don't reuse lower jail IDs, uh, the snapshot is complete. So uh, if you to, to, to answer the, the question, to answer the question with a yes or no, can daemon be used to monitor a jail? No. To monitor well, an application. A single inside. jail, yes. And that's the trick. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a good one. Yes, please. I would like to run hundreds so of daemons. What you can do is you basically use daemon to you run jexec on the host, or you just run daemon inside a jail. Or you even use a daemon to rerun the jail command. I could use daemon to run the jail command, which means it daemon itself will, will run etcrc inside the jail, and then no, daemon will just monitor. Just the jail command, I would recommend. Okay. Okay. Jail dash r, jail dash c, and so on, in a okay. little loop in a script. So when you, okay. And then you would have your um, so that it doesn't just run insanely quickly. You would then configure your jail st uh, basically. Uh, jail exec dot start to stay in the foreground and not demonize itself or you uh, keep the jail around and just if you care about a process inside a jail you can start it from the host sorry. with demon and j sorry I, I, I didn't get that part so demon would run what the jail command with what okay um you would you write a jail exec dot start uh, mm -hmm. it's documented because uh, for pot with nomad there's a task driver for nomad and they have the same requirement that basically the tasks have to be direct descendants and have to stay in the foreground okay you do that by basically for example configuring let's say engine x with no demon I, no, I understand your point. My, my question is, daemon would run the jail command, but would execute what? Would execute the jail ETC? command, jail dash R, followed by jail dash C. Okay, uh, that th dash C what? Like, is, is it running? Jail is it dash run C, jail name. Uh, okay, no, no, no. My, my question is, the jail would be running bin sh etc rc because that would, no, you know. Uh, that would then be the, the first start. Exactly. Because, uh, and then the second one, uh -huh. so if you want it to feel mostly like a normal FreeBSD user land, you would run the normal etc RC script to completion. And then the service you want to supervise with the daemon command okay. would then be run through either the jail <laughs> command by being the second j dot exec value, or you can have... Um, a post start with jxec uh, in there. So yeah, there are multiple ways to skin that cat. So yes, it can be done if you want to have one daemon process supervise one process that just works. As, so basically jxec isn't okay. in the way. Okay, okay. So because I would really start, start my jail as I usually would do, and then I would use the daemon command to jexec and run, a, let's say, nginx dash capital F or whatever. Something like it. that, yeah. But but that would be monitoring a process inside the jail, yes. right? But yes, and that's most of the time what you really care about because okay. it's the process which is the service you care about. Okay. So, and the jail cannot be destroyed without also destroying the process. The process can die without the jail dying unless it's the only process in a um, unferal jail. 
but yeah. okay 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 now now i'm getting a better idea about this okay because i was thinking that like the daemon command would run the jail create but instead of calling etcrc i would call something that would boot the jail but not put it on the uh background so, rather keep it on the foreground so it would like monitor the whole jail you know there are multiple ways to do that and it depends on your use okay. case which one makes sense Okay, got it, got it. Okay, got it. Um, yeah. Let's to the question, what does persist affect in practice? I actually like this question because like someone actually sat down and mm -hmm. took my advice of reading the whole man page and he's like, what the hell is persist? Finally. I do okay. not understand what persist does. Uh, Jamie, do you uh, want to... Uh... Answer that or anyone else because so far I've completely dominated this session. Yeah, I mean it's simply uh when a jail dies with without persist, a jail is dependent on its processes to be around. With mm -hmm. persist, the jail dies until it is explicitly I mean jail stays until it is explicitly killed. Got it. So so technically so I can with persist you can have a jail that exists that has no processes in it. Right. So which is yeah. and this, this relates very nicely religion. to the concept of what what even does it mean to have a jail that's a demon? Well, the answer is if you've got persist, not really a lot, um, because it's just not going to disappear. Um, so does that mean with persist, I can quote unquote reboot a jail, like kill all the processes and start from ground up without changing his GID? Yes. Yeah. You can also reuse look at GID, even if Jamie regrets that feature ever existing. <laughs> it's not just Jamie. I, I also regret. <laughs> I also regret having that feature. Okay. Because I noticed that for some reason, when we were creating Jailer, we added persist in our default config. And I never looked into the details of why, so, but I think um, I should remove that. I can probably get, give a good, good guess what's the problem here. If the jail is destroyed by the kernel, uh, the problem is that only the prison structure in the kernel is basically released and thereby mm -hmm. the jail is destroyed. What does not happen is that any of the shutdown exec hooks uh, do not get exec. So there is no uh, exec dot uh, pre stop post stop post stop and stuff like this. So uh, no release hook and also no file system handling. And the way mm -hmm. the jail command currently implements file system support is very fragile in this regard. So what will happen is that if your jail dies because you kill all processes in it and the kernel garbage collects the, the jail, uh, the jail is gone, but its mount points are still there, including Got its it. device file system and mm -hmm. file, file system. Mm -hmm. and potentially other file systems. But these are problematic because the next time the jail command will just refuse to start. So in a container environment, I would have no persist. So if my processes do die, let's say someone actually run shut down inside a jail. I don't even know if that works, but let's assume someone or someone actually yeah. ran yeah, etc rc sh dot shut down the, the, the script, then yeah. it would, all the processes would die, and then the kernel would be like, okay, I'm releasing, the, I'm releasing the prison, which means the jail now will execute the post. Uh, no, that is oh. the part that does not happen. Because oh. the kernel does not restart the jail command. You have a mismatch of lifetimes here. The If you start a jail with a jail command, as is commonly done, by default, without persist, okay. you start the jail command. So you have the jail command starting up, reading the configuration, turning it into a list of commands to execute and running through this list of commands. Okay. And then it has done its job and exits, losing everything it knows about the runtime state because the process intentionally exited. It didn't crash, it didn't die, it intentionally ran to completion and still its state is lost. So that's a good place to use devctl jail kmod. Uh, so yes we, and no. Yes and no, okay. Uh, yes, you can use the devctl messages if you uh -huh. have this kernel module to get yes. the notification uh, without polling and then respond to that. The problem okay. is that you still have the, some hooks which are, it's too late to run because you can't do the 
pre-stop and uh, stop hooks, basically the one mm -hmm. running on the host and inside the jail to stop the mm -hmm. jail cleanly. For example, mm -hmm. if you use the pre-stop one to remove the jail from a load balancer pool, for at example, that point, okay. it's too late. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can do it Strip again. Around. Yeah. If it's in the item potent to basically say this yeah. container environment is no longer part of this load uh, manager pool, then yeah, okay, you can do it through the post stop again. I'm getting to the point where like but, on, on we might need to modify if config to have things like create if doesn't exist, right? Yeah, so like of course, if, and that's yeah, why, okay, what I've been doing it. for the last weeks uh, and has mentioned here multiple <laughs> times um, yes. that we need item potent versions of the common commands. Okay. But Got it. Um, the problem is that um, if you make the jail persistent, it doesn't get destroyed and it lasts until you're uh, in ask until I run, to destroy yeah, it. Yeah, until I do jail dash R. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, got or it. the right system call, which is done by yeah. the, executed by the command. The this is what a, in my opinion, a proper like container workflow jail manager should do. Yeah. It should not rely on the jail being auto destroyed. Instead, it should supervise the jail. Mm -hmm. Notice that this jail has become empty. Mm -hmm. for, and then do its thing. Okay. And for example, it could register itself as sub repo. Um, there are multiple ways again. Okay. Got it. Got and it. I don't know if any one of them is perfect. The nice yeah. thing about rely tr trusting the kernel to garbage collect the jail and notify you about it is that, yeah, the kernel will do the correct thing uh, with regards to atomically verifying that the jail is empty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before destroying it, which can potentially be a bit hard because what happens, yeah, if you have to have some kind of locking in your control plane at that right. point. Let's say the last process in a jail has exit and at the same time there is a request to start a new command in it queued. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, the last question came because the students were playing with LXC as well as JLs, and now mm -hmm. they, on, on Linux, they see things like VETH, some random numbers. Yeah. On uh, Linux, uh, sorry, on FreeBSD, they used my blog post, which now apparently is part of the handbook as well, yay, which, uh, okay, and we create like e pair, some ID, and A, e pair ID B, and the student was like, hey, can I... Because they also played the CTF, and thank you, Jan, for the idea of having emojis as, you know, uh, in, uh, this uh, interface names. That was all, always a brilliant idea, apparently. And 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 they're no, like, okay, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> can we can we put the name of the interface with the name of the jail? I'm like, hey, that's a very good idea. But then when we try to do like if config create. Uh, interface name, um, it would only rename the EPR A. So Jan yep. gave a good answer in the chat, which is to run a script that looks like EPR underscore A equals blah, 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 equal B equals whatever EPR A variable was and then do string so, substitution, which brings me a question to Jamie. Can I run that inside uh, exec.prestart in a single line and then the GL utility will run it in a because like the main problem with the jail utilities pre and post is that i probably can't define environment variables inside it right like i can't do epr a equals some command execution then reuse that variable in another um, point, right? yeah they're their own separate shell sessions there are separate cell, shell sessions okay got it but, but if i do if I put the whole thing in it in a single line, then it would, would it would work fine. It doesn't yes. have to be a single line because strings in jlot can on can be multi-line or expand to multiple lines. But, yes. it, it's important for the expansion to work that is is a single valued property or variable because mm -hmm. you cannot expand multi-valued variables, which mm -hmm. is another annoying limitation. I would love for it to just 
concatenate them with new lines as a joiner. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jan, do you have an example for multi-line uh, uh, config? For, for pre yeah, lots. Uh, just check the uh, minutes for all my crazy uh, jill.conf examples. Basically, all of them make use of multi-line. Got uh, it. Exec hooks. Um, I'll add one in there. So basically, what what is important is that it is a single string, but the string can contain inner new lines. Mm -hmm. And that then gets just piped into sh-s or something, I think, right? Or do you use sh-c, Jamie? I don't recall right offhand. <laughs> but yeah, I think it just gets it, it, the value it, it gets is... piped into sh-s or something. I, I think it's, yeah, I, no, I think it's sh-c because I've, I've looked at that part of the yeah, code before. It also works if you use the exec uh, system yeah. directly without going through an additional layer of interaction. I'm yeah. trying to find an example. I'm sure we have it somewhere in here, especially the craziness that you used to do uh, with but, like um, creation of the creation of uh, with with package base. It's it's somewhere in the minute notes. I'm I'm pretty sure of that. Yes. Um, yeah, Michael just opened my gist for the MKE pair. So the problem is normally if you use uh, if config. Uh, Interface create with driver and uh, unit number as argument. Uh, the kernel will create an interface with a known name because the name is just something like uh, uh, ton zero or tap 23 or something. Here, that just works and you don't have any problem with, with knowing which interface you created because you explicitly told the kernel, please create this interface. Uh, the problem with this is that if the interface already exists, um, yeah, that just doesn't work. So mm -hmm. um, the, for example, in the context of jail configurations, then you have to basically hard code the interface name into the jail configuration, which mm -hmm. gets tedious and is not very human friendly. The better way to do it is to uh, have the kernel pick the next available uh, unit of the cloner. So if config tan create, and then you get tan zero, tan one, three, four, five, 17, whatever. So mm -hmm. the next, the unallocated unit number, similar to how you get, if you uh, open a file, the next free uh, file descriptor number. So, so the smallest this, unit number, which is not allocated. This does bring me to a, a question that but, my students don't have, but I do have. So say I use the line that you wrote there in uh, uh, question number six, answer B, run E pair A, etc. So it will be auto-generated. Okay, that does sound great. But then mm -hmm. say I want to set it as a static IP, for example, inside, uh, in, inside the jail. Okay, Not so if 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 I if I run this uh, today, it might be e pair ten. Tomorrow, it might be e pair eleven. How would I configure around this inside the jail? Like now, the foundation uh, released images mm -hmm. they have if config default, which I I yep. don't like that much because you know, d d yep. God knows what I would know. happen. Any idea on how I would do that inside the jail if the in interface name? might be so, changing. Uh, is there a um, way to... Uh, the preferred way is to not have the interface name change. Okay. By, uh, allocating the interface dynamically and then assigning it a stable name. Got it. Okay. My preferred way to do that is to embed the jail name into the interface name. The annoying limitation is that both FreeBSD and Linux limit interface names to... 15 characters and a null byte. Yeah. So 16 bytes of storage. Yeah. And so you Good. get to the rescue. Okay. Short <laughs> interface names. Um then yeah, that's just how it is. And it's unless you break the ABI and blow up a bunch of structs in the uh, network stack to make space for uh, larger interface names, 
that's not going to happen because it isn't a pointer to a string, mm -hmm. but it's an internal character array inside kernel structs. So, yeah, yeah it's... I, 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 I think UUID might be a good use case in here, you know, because like... Um... Yeah, but you can't fit a UUID in ASCII uh, because that's uh, 16 bytes. All no, I mean, I mean, pop, I mean, a random generated string rather. That's that's what yeah. I meant. Uh, yeah, yeah. Instead of you saving that, i uh, equal one, two, three, four, or whatever ID I'm generating now. Currently, I'm just generating whatever ID is available mm -hmm. plus one, or you know, something like that. Um, like, and what you one. can also do is um, do it inside of jail dot created. I think mm -hmm. it gets executed. Um, so if you have jail dot created. So um, if I remember correctly, that should execute in the yeah in the system environment. So it executes on the host after the jail command has already created the jail. Mm -hmm. You know the jail name. You can access the jail uh, name, get the jail ID, and then you can have the Billy make the JID. That is a short name, but it changes. So yeah, but the other thing you can do. If you want the host to assign an IP address to the jail, is inside of jail.created, use jxec to run sysrc inside the jail to basically run sysrc inside the jail. Okay. So you can use sysrc to set ifconfig underscore current interface name and then just inject this into the either the global rc.conf or if you want it to be cleaner, you can also put it somewhere else. Uh, and there are a bunch of places to put it. You couldn't put it into any of the ones uh, loaded by the mm -hmm. etc rc.dnetif script uh, load uh, and it loads the etc uh, netif and network. So if you have an etc uh, rc. Uh, the network file that also works. Uh, yeah, that's a compatibility thing. And for a jail manager, the most interesting place to put it would be the vendor uh, rc.conf file. Mm -hmm. There's a file, let me grab for the exact uh, name. Oh, you mean? Uh, it's uh, etc defaults vendor.conf. Yes. So this is a file you can reasonably claim belongs to the jail manager and just dump it in there, override that with the current startups vendor configuration, which could be the default one. And I think it can be overwritten. So if the user really wants to override this, the etcrc.conf uh, is loaded afterwards, so it should uh, have uh, basically higher priority because yeah uh, let's check yeah da, 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 da. but now we're getting really into implementation details and yeah allow vendors to override freebsd defaults in etc default yep. rc Without this is a very good one. I might actually need this for our lower OS because uh, I've been thinking about using package base. And the nicest idea that I got is uh, don't do anything, don't do anything inside etc. Do everything in user local etc., which has uh, been going very well. By but, the way, yeah. you can use it to put. It's nasty, but it's intentionally supported. Mm -hmm. If you. If you just say this is my file as jail manager and you're not supposed to use it with sysrc on this file, you can put a little shell script in there to source other files, which are then managed using sysrc. So what you would do is basically put a dot space and then some path, potentially multiple paths, uh, or even a for loop to find multiple files, check if they're readable and if they're readable. Uh, so, and then do a for blah, 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 do a glob and find all the files in some directory uh, and load all of them. So that, 
you can just dump snippets in there under a well-known path and atomically override this these files in a directory. So yeah, that would be the, in my opinion, best way to have a way to nice. programmatically manage parts of the configuration mm -hmm. without completely uh, ripping out the existing RC system, which mm -hmm. really you shouldn't do unless you're prepared to commit several full-time um, employees to supporting this. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, if you have a five-man team, the responsibility it is to do that, go ahead. Uh, you will, if you... Uh, last, thought... last question, not from my students, but rather from my company, which is, um, say I'm using a utility like SysRC or BSD config. And this might be actually interesting for a lot of vendors. Say I'm using a utility like SysRC or BSD config. And say I change the network configuration yep. um, with sysrc or network config. So, oh, 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 sorry, BS, BSD config. So by default, it always will change the configuration inside etcrc.conf. Is there a way to tell it that hey, don't modify it in there in that main file? Like never touch etcrc.conf, but always put the configuration in say user local etcrc.com because you know service and all the services they always do parse user local etcrc.com i'm pretty uh, sure those are um, like dash r so root takes that, a path no? as argument yeah. one by one sorry I, uh, I heard both answers but didn't understand any go again <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's like a dash r root flag or something that just lets you specify what path to operate in, but maybe it's either um, root of the OS or, you know, like a jail, or maybe it can choose user local, but go ahead. Let's look at the manual page. So looks like this RC takes a data. file path. Okay. 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 That's nice. Um, but the other thing to watch out for, because again, it means that it sources shell scripts, which yeah, can run arbitrary commands mm -hmm. uh, to do things. So if you use it for a jail manager, it's important to run the sysrc uh, command in the same um, isolation um, you run the jail. So do not use sysrc sorry, on the host to look into a jail. Use jexec sysrc to look at the jail. Sorry, Jan, what would be the difference between, like, why, why not use sysrc-j? Because sysrc uses the normal parsing uh, logic uh, of RC, which means source the configuration files as shell scripts, execute them as code as the current user. And you can put an rm okay, rf slash star got in your it, jail configuration it, it, file it. and wait for it to explode. Got it, host. got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's, Maybe that's, there's that's... a little bit of uh, defense in SysRC by now, but it used to be that, at least in the early days, it did the same thing and the normal RC scripts really could that the... be? Could that also be true about FreeBSD update? Like, say you want to update your FreeBSD with FreeBSD update dash J, is there something that it uh, forces? I think the something? dash J flag uses JXEC to go into the J. So. Ironically, we implemented that and we upstreamed it, but I have no idea how we did that two years ago. So I'll, I'll have to ask yeah, my team. But it's just <laughs> uh, so if I remember correctly, FreeBSD updates jail support. If there is even one, it's just the um, it's just a wrapper to make it easier to use than having to type jxec jail name and then the normal command. Uh, if if it does not use jxec, it's broken. Okay, that's nice. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, that 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 this has been a problem that we've been having for a while. Like how to never ever touch base, and always 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 touch everything in user local. Thank you for BSD hierarchy. I think that was one of the reasons why we actually chose free BSD in the first place. 
Um, so, yeah. We haven't heard Nick. Hi, Nick. Hello. <laughs> Any questions, Nick? No, I don't. Okay. And Jan, was that an adequate coverage of your item potent networking script? Is that ready to ship? Or are you still working no, on it? Um, I, I ran into a bunch of both timing problems and conflicts and just uh, I want to do it right. So uh, I don't want to take nasty shortcuts so that the command implementations are simple so that you can drop new commands in over time and it turns out yeah things like exception handling and error handling so that in an error case the operation stops uh, and you still get valid json from libxo and so on that was a bit more research than i expected um but yeah i have a proof of concept code to create interfaces using Netlink. Uh, it doesn't have to be Netlink. Uh, it, I could have used the yeah, Octal as well. Uh, it, I found out that Netlink does support exactly what I need, just like VI Octals before it did. So that's not a problem. Now I just have to set up the scaffolding so that each additional command to add other than just listing the cloners uh, loaded into the kernel and cloning an interface is easy to add so that there are no uh, global lists of all commands. You have to manually add things so that mm -hmm. it's easy to just drop in a new command as a new C file, uh, add it to the make file, compile and get a new command built in with help and so on. I can show the prototype stuff but it's not useful right now uh yeah which uh, brings me oh sorry it's late here which brings me to a, a final question because next week is going to be busy i assume everyone's having their christmases and such um yeah. the, the free bsd quarterly status is coming up on the december 31st um uh so do we have anything to send from the jail group? Like, did we implement any new thing in the last quarter that I, I should add there as like I, either new idea that we're working on or something that we have actually implemented? Because I mean, you implemented is your uh, jailer CTL SSH support. Oh, I mean, sure, but I mean, uh, the, the jailer is. I mean, no, I don't. I don't mean jailer itself, because like, but rather on the whole jail, jail. Because I mean, when we did the dot include, we did not. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we did not send um, a quarterly update, as far as I remember. And people, uh, I, I've, I've talked to some admins, and they're like, "Oh, the dot include is a feature now." I, we did not even know about it because people apparently don't read release notes. Um, which is fine, I guess. Yeah. So well, if they're not aware of release notes, then I'm equally pretty much aware of, unaware of quarterly updates. So unfortunately, those two didn't mesh well. <laughs> so Maybe? so yeah, if we if we because I, I might have forgot, I'm not sure. Like, do we have anything to send for this quarter? Not implemented, but on the radar, my uh -huh. you know my next thing is going to be the uh, descriptors. Yeah, that would be really nice to have, and. Again, when playing with uh, uh, ABIs and or, or more correctly APIs available, um, I found that it's so annoying to use right now because it's name based and not descriptor based. So it's really errors are always possible because because you can't reserve things. For example, I can't reserve a name and then create the interface and then later say, yeah, we use the pre-reserved name. So uh, this makes it a lot harder than it should be. And then, because if I basically could have a file descriptor and have the interface mm -hmm. tied to this associated file descriptor, then uh, you would avoid all the problems with name reuse and race conditions. But it also would be a neat way to basically create an interface with a temporary name, do a bunch of stuff with it. And if you just die without doing a basically detach iOctal or whatever kind of interface you want to use on it, uh, it gets auto-destroyed as part of process cleanup. So it basically the kernel undoes partial uh, 
network configurations uh, if a command dies with kill dash nine or something. Um, oh, what? Uh, you have to run, uh, Andrene? Oh, I've got food on the table and um, yeah. And let's see, maybe we've covered all these topics adequately and we should simply call it. Yeah, I can stay a while longer, but let's, I, I think we can call it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, what we'll be gathering in an hour anyway. <laughs> what? I'm okay, uh, Colin. Right. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Beat you through it, Antrenig. And I wish you a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you. See you in the open. Bye. Goodbye.